Bueno. Muy buenos días. Desde el Centro Argentino de Ingenieros les damos la bienvenida y les agradecemos una vez más que nos acompañen en este acto que nos honra, como es el reconocimiento de un socio honorario del CAI. En el día de hoy, este reconocimiento es para la nueva socia honoraria Margot Bain, a quien le agradecemos especialmente que haya aceptado esta mención. Leeré una breve bio de ella para luego cederle la palabra al presidente del Centro Argentino de Ingenieros, el ingeniero Pablo Berecertúa. Margot Bain es profesora titular de Ingeniería de Sistemas de Procesos y Energía en la Universidad Tecnológica de Delft, en los Países Bajos, desde 1995. Es la fundadora y directora científica de Next Generation Infrastructures, la plataforma de conocimiento nacional holandesa de proveedores de infraestructura desde 2001. Fue miembro de la Junta de Gobierno de System Man and Cybernetic Society y estableció el Comité Técnico para la Infraestructura en Sistemas y Servicios. Ha participado en numerosas capacidades de asesoramiento para el gobierno holandés y para la Comisión Europea como miembro del Grupo Asesor de la Comisión Europea sobre Energía, el Consejo Holandés de Política Científica y Tecnológica, el Consejo General de Energía de los Países Bajos y el Consejo Científico de los Países Bajos para la Política Gubernamental. De 2009 a 2021 fue miembro del Consejo de Supervisión de Axo Nobel Netherlands. Desde marzo de 2020 es miembro del Consejo Ejecutivo Nacional de Investigación de los Países Bajos, donde preside el Consejo Ejecutivo del Dominio de Ingeniería y Ciencias Aplicadas. Además, actualmente preside el Consejo Asesor del Centro Real Aeroespacial de los Países Bajos y es miembro del Consejo Super Supervisión de Shell Netherlands eh, BB. Con esta mini presentación le doy la palabra al, al ingeniero Pablo Bérez y Artúa, presidente del CAI, para que comience este acto. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Verónica. Muy buenos días a todos. Para mí es un gran gusto dar inicio a este evento con eh, la participación de nuestra invitada Margot Wayne, a quien estamos distinguiendo como socia honoraria del Centro Argentino de Ingenieros. Voy a, como hacemos normalmente en estos casos, a pasar al idioma inglés y vamos a continuar el evento en inglés, que va a consistir primero en la designación de Margot y luego en una conversación, una serie de preguntas que le haré a Margot y que eh, están todos invitados a, a pensar o a comentar o a tener también eh, sus propias preguntas que seguramente eh, comentaremos con ella hacia el final de nuestra conversación. So I will turn into English. Good morning everybody. It is for me a real pleasure to be uh, making the opening of this event. Uh, for us it's a very significant event and I'm very glad to have with us Margot Wayne, who is going to be now named uh, Honorary Fellow of our institution. The Argentinian Engineering Center, as you probably know, is a 126-year-old institution. It is the main institution in our country uh, in the issues of engineering uh, in a very broad sense. And in order to proceed with this act, this event, I'd like to go through the um, by law article where we define what it is to be designed, uh, to be named, I'm sorry, honorary fellow of the Argentinian Engineering Center. And according to our bylaws, this uh, is a degree that is conferred to people, uh, both men and women who uh, are uh, in science, engineering or, or other fields, and they become public figures because uh, of their outstanding contribution in their country and as a whole um, for their knowledge and their actions, which uh, happens to be highly beneficial for the humanity, the country or the profession. And this uh, also very important is a designation, which is a lifelong designation. And uh, without uh, the promotion or the Um, requisite from the uh, designee. So this is a, a designation that is uh, being reached by uh, the common decision of our board, and it is only conferred to outstanding people 
um, because of the, their experience and also because of the way they have led uh, interesting and significant projects and uh, initiatives. So for us, Margot, it is a real honor to uh, um, today to name you honorary fellow of the Argentinian Engineering Center. And in this act, also, we believe that we are including you as a, a member of our extended, uh, extended uh, family and uh, that we count on you for uh, uh, different ideas, uh, projects and policies that typically our institution uh, fosters and, and, and promotes. So um, a real pleasure for us, Margot. Well, Pablo, that was a very long introduction. Um, buenos dias, good morning to all of you. Um, I've been listening to your uh, bylaw, uh, and I feel truly honored. Let me that's uh, let me say that it's um, I feel truly honored, and um, I'm looking forward to being more actively engaged in the uh, network of the Argentine and Argentina uh, Engineering Center. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, uh, let us see where, uh, where our joint, uh, where we find joint interests and where we can do good for um, Dutch and Argentinian society and uh, the wider world, I would say. Great. So as, as we do, Margot, in, in, in these uh, events uh, with our honorary fellows, Typically, we will be having a conversation uh, with you uh, very broadly and very informal on some of the ideas and, and, and projects and, and initiatives uh, that have to do with your own experience. So let me begin by asking you, um, wh wh what, what is this infrastructure for you? Ah, infrastructure for me is not what I think many engineers tend to think which uh, I think most uh, of my engineering colleagues tend to see infrastructure as um, physical structures, which are uh, very challenging, you know, to be designed and operated. For me, infrastructure is a lot more than that. It's uh, the physical infrastructures are an important dimension of it, but I see the physical dimension as a part of a wider system that is providing an essential service to society. So for me, infrastructure is not uh, a system which, is, uh, which has a, a, a very strong engineering and physical dimension, but I think uh, what I would like to em emphasize is the social dimension of it as well. Um, infrastructure systems, whether in transport, or energy, or water, or flood defenses, or you know whatever. They provide essential services that are at the basis of really each and every supply chain. Um, without it, um, businesses cannot function. Without the services, uh, I think also ordinary citizens cannot really participate in, an, in society. And without such essential services, if you are, uh, if you do not have access to uh, digital infrastructure, if you do not have access to energy infrastructure, then you cannot, as a citizen, uh, make a meaningful contribution to society or to the economy as part of society. And I think that aspect that implies that um, infrastructure is something that, you know, it should be available um, and affordable uh, and acceptable to each and every member of society. That's very important. And it should be perhaps a little bit more um, uh, strongly ingrained in the minds of engineering professionals. Yeah, so in this uh, broad uh, view that you have about infrastructure, how do you place the words complexity, complex system, adaptive system, uh, evolutionary systems? Uh, where shall we start? <laughs> I think if we look at the infrastructure in our direct vicinity, the infrastructure uh, to which we are attached in our homes, 
in the neighborhoods, the street, our cities, then we know it's part of, um, it's, it's all connected to regional systems, to countrywide systems, to continental and even global systems. So that is part of the complexity. Another part of the complexity is that the system is constantly uh, balancing um, supply and demand. It's, um, but I think the most interesting dimension of complexity here is the evolutionary um, development of infrastructure. We know that a lot of the infrastructure that we use every day um, was uh, designed uh, not, not many years, but often many decades ago. And it's still serving us today. And in the meantime, society has changed profoundly uh, and still it's serving us. So apparently there is in this system tremendous flexibility to um, retain its function as the fabric of society, the fabric of a changing society. And I find that fascinating because in the meantime, of course, technology has changed. We have implemented lots and lots of technological innovations, but in other parts of the system, there is also still a lot of old technology in place, which is also still functional. And this interplay of old and new and this interplay also of the old values that we designed into the system and the new priorities of society, because our values are also changing. Um, that's, I find that fascinating. And then if you follow that line, how do you see the infrastructures changing now? How, how are they going to be different in the next years? Uh, let, let's see, for example, what we look around and we see people playing with electric cars, for example. Or if you look in Europe, you will find in Germany a train, a railway that is uh, working with hydrogen, for example. So, um, and, and, and we can find many other examples of that. But, but the, the question is, uh, what are the main drivers and how do you see infrastructures really changing and becoming maybe more intelligent, more clever in the future? maybe more adaptive and the uh, same infrastructure may be useful for different functions and also maybe more sustainable with new materials and, 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 and maybe um, uh, what we now assume is a very fixed reality will become more organic in the future and will be um, in a sense integrated with nature. So can you elaborate on that? Is that real? What do you see happening? These are very big questions, Pablo, and I think you know that better than many of us. I think the big drivers at the moment for change in the world of infrastructure are the, 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 the societal challenges that we are all aware of. It's about sustainability, about the combat of climate change. It's about the energy transition. It's about uh, our quest to establish a circular economy. It's also, uh, I think, uh, the combat of inequality in society uh, at, at, a, at a global level, but also within our national societies. Those are the drivers of change at the moment. Uh, then at this, um, at, at this moment, we have a whole new um, portfolio of technologies at, at our disposal. And uh, um, a key characteristic of many of these new technologies is that they, for instance, in energy, is that they are decentralized. They allow a relatively small scale decentralized uh, production of um, electricity, for example, or of heat. Um, and this uh, trend towards uh, uh, technological decentralization is accompanied in many countries, at least in Europe, by a trend towards administrative decentralization. It seems that the decision-making about a new infrastructure development, about new infrastructure policy even, is uh, shifting from the national level to the local level or to regional levels. That's a very big difference, um, which offers opportunities, I think, to um, come up with much more tailor-made solutions for the needs of local communities. 
Uh, on the other hand, I think there are also threats in this development because local governments may not be sufficiently aware of um, the, the context of the national and international networks and of how the international markets behave. So that's, that's, that's an interesting um, uh, development that will also, I think, influence in engineering decisions. What I see um, happening at the moment is that the interdependencies between infrastructure are very much intensifying. Uh, let's take the energy sector, for example. In the past, we used to um, develop gas infrastructure, electricity infrastructure, heat infrastructure, fuel infrastructures, transport fuel infrastructures, as more or less completely separate systems. Um, some in the private uh, realm, others in the public realm. Um, but now, all these systems with the um, increasing share of um, renewables in electricity, for example, we see that all these different systems come to rely upon each other much more uh, strongly than they ever did before. So um, it's, it's, I think in the, in the, in, in the future, we um, cannot, um, how would I put this? We, we need, I think, uh, what we, we are in dire need of much more consistency in the legal and regulatory framework that apply, uh, um, that apply to these different infrastructures at the moment. What I see also in the European system here is a lot of inconsistency, which is detrimental to the technological innovation that we would like to see. But you mentioned uh, electric cars and you mentioned hydrogen. So what we see is that um, because of the variability in, um, uh, the, in renewable energy resources, um, we need much more flexibility in other uh, production options, but also in demand. And uh, as the share of renewable energy resources is increasing, we need more and more flexibility on the demand side. So that's where the electric vehicles come in, whether they are all, uh, all electric uh, battery vehicles or whether they are uh, hydrogen fueled um, uh, fuel cell uh, vehicles. Um, so, and, and we need to organize this uh, through aggregators, through different markets, which all rely on intelligence, on, on, on censoring, on, on digital information and communication all the time. So what we see happening now is that uh, a whole new amalgamate infrastructure system is emerging, which consists of electricity infrastructure, uh, mobility infrastructure, digital uh, and telecommunications infrastructure, which is, I think we should see this as a new infrastructure system. We cannot have digital infrastructure just managed by one ministry and mobility by another uh, ministry and energy by another ministry because all these systems are completely um, merging. That's, that's, that's one of the most telling, I think, and also very challenging developments that I see happening at the moment. So you see that the institutions also will have to change and they are yeah. changing, but they will need to change even more in order to, uh, to so to say, being able to, to handle all these uh, possibilities yes. and, yeah. and the I demand. Think... Because there is also, I believe, I don't know what you think, but in the, in the newer generations, the younger people, they, they really are demanding a, a new way of living um, and, and they, they want their values to be really present uh, in the way they consume and they invest. So if, uh, if the system is not able to provide that, then there will be political consequences. So, um, so that, that I think is very interesting because the institution we have right now, mainly the nation states, they are very old, over 100 and 150 years old, in a sense, the way we organize how to manage a society. So is it real? And you believe that due to all, to, 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 to all these possibilities now, coupled with the value-driven demand of the newer generations, 
we will have to update our governments. We, we are talking governments and institutions. So these are different things, I would say. But uh, y yes, I think the institutions that we have are heavily technology biased. And of course, institutions emerged from the technologies that used to dominate the past. And they are still not sufficiently adapted to the technologies of today and of the future. Um, and, 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 and honestly, it is really difficult to, I, let's say I don't have a clear cut answer as to how governments should be much more responsive and flexible in adapting the institutions um, to the technologies of the future. What I do see when you mention uh, the values and, and uh, the, the needs of the, of the younger generation, I think one of the things that we should really reconsider is um, to redefine essential services. Um, I think that in modern society, um, access to um, a fast, um, uh, to, to, to let's say to large capacity broadband, to, to a fast internet is as essential as access to electricity or clean drinking water or to mobility. Yeah. And it's still not defined as such in our laws, now, whereas the access to uh, clean and affordable drinking water and to reliable electricity, you know, the, the, these essential services and these are, are anchored as social rights in our law, uh, in our laws in the Netherlands and in other European countries. But the, uh, but access to, um, uh, high quality fast internet has not been defined uh, as such yeah. yet, really? which is clearly which is clearly a gap, I would say, uh, in 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 uh, in regulations on infrastructure services. Yeah, that is very interesting. Now, if you take it that to an extreme, so the consequences of these changes, uh, do you see also dangers or do you see threats? Uh, that we have to pay attention. So is, is, is everything going to be better than we, than we expect or we may be facing challenges and if we don't know how to, to manage those challenges, we may end up in, in a worsened condition? Um, well, cybersecurity, to name just one risk, I think is very prominent. We are all aware of it, uh, aware of it, and I think uh, almost uh, all of us and and all governments uh, uh, are exposed to it and and have already suffered uh, from it. But uh, so far, all the answers are um, inadequate, I would say. So that's that's really uh, a big concern for the future. Um, I would also say that. Climate change is, I think, being grossly underestimated as, uh, as a big threat for the future. Um, because, you know, whether it's, it's well, we have seen the, the, the consequences of the extreme cold period. This, this short cold period, I think it was February in Texas, when the whole economy came to a standstill, when there was no electricity, no gas, no nothing, no water. Uh, so you see how extreme weather events can reduce a country to, uh, um, let's say, a state uh, of, of uh, the Middle Ages, you know, in, in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So they were um, not very well prepared, let's put it mildly. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, um, yes, extreme, just, just even short uh, bouts of extreme cold or extreme heat, you know, can cripple a lot of our infrastructure easily. Uh, and then I'm not even talking about uh, large scale flooding or something like that. It's uh, these, these are, are, are real and present dangers, I think for, for, for uh, modern day society. And how do you see the new, so to say policies that uh, governments and, and maybe now even the private sector is, is uh, more, clearly talking about like the Green Deal. So many people uh, believe that this pandemic has uh, recent 
the so to say the the understanding that we are really playing at the at the very uh, end of the possibilities of the system and we need to change policies and if you look at uh, recent events like the new administration in the US some of the policies in Europe even the G7 uh, summit and the build uh, back better what they say um, so what what do you think is uh, really going to happen with the green deal are we facing really new policies are we going to see new ways of uh, evaluating risks including climate change including nature and also new possibilities of uh, financing policies where do you see the private uh, vis-a-vis -vis the public sector I know there are many questions there, but how, how do many, you see Many, many questions. I think one of the bis big risks, I see a lot of governments, um, you know, striving to do good. I think the new administration in the US is one of the examples. And, and in Europe, we have just um, embraced a new climate law and um, uh, increased uh, our ambition from 49 to 55% uh, CO2 reduction eh, in um, uh, 2035. So this is, uh, it's, it's, uh, there is a lot of ambition. Um, at the same time, you know, it, in, in our democratic systems, it all, it's, it's not so easy to, uh, secure a certain stability of government and a certain stability of policies. And what I'm really concerned about is uh, a sort of widespread erosion that is happening um, of an erosion of trust in, in science, an erosion of trust in, 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 in rational thinking, uh, an erosion of trust in facts, um, which is uh, very much, I think, uh, stimulated by, by populist um, forces in society. And that's, I think, a real threat um, that may lead to uh, wantingly um, denying, you know, that, um, that we are exposed to, to some real and present danger. And, and, and it may cripple, you know, any, any uh, adequate um, policy answer. So that's, that's I think, uh, a threat. When it comes to the pandemic, yeah, of course, I didn't mention that. I'm, I'm very curious to see if, it, if this may uh, lead to um, a change in the trend towards uh, urbanization worldwide because we have seen cities growing, growing, growing. It's, it's as, as if uh, the countryside is emptying all over the world. Maybe that uh, development is, is, is halted or at least uh, reduced by, uh, by the pandemic and the fact that everybody is aware of um, risks of uh, pandemics. That's a, that's a big point. Um, I remember a book by a Harvard professor, Edward Glasser, that is called the, the triumph of the cities. And the main thesis of the book is that cities are our main invention in a way. And um, innovation is becoming the, the key asset, the key capacity of a society. And you need to interact in order to innovate. And cities are, are very valuable because they are the, the, the platform for, for increasing innovation, so to say. So do you think that these are our technologies? And you know, right now we are handling this event, and naming you honorary fellow of our institution, and, and you are in, in the Netherlands, and we are here in Buenos Aires, uh, in Argentina, and it is happening, and it is happening in, I think it's, it's, it's a very, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, useful event in a sense. I mean, we are managing to exchange ideas and to have a conversation and, and, and even, even to do it in public. And, and also with many other positive consequences. For example, this is going to be recorded and it's going to be online for other people to yeah. watch uh, later. So do you believe that we are in a really um, uh, changing mode and we will live differently even if the pandemia um, uh, is, uh, is a way and we, and, and we overcome the pandemia, we will keep using um, these technologies and, and changing our, our way of, of living? Is this happening? I think we will use them um, 
much more purposefully. Um, and I think we will keep using them, these, uh, let's say, all these new um, digital communication technologies, um, because we have um, now being able to, we have been able to experience, you know, how effective they are and, and to what extent they uh, allow us to continue our um, international collaboration and exchange of, of thoughts. But it's, I think at the same time, we have to acknowledge that humans are social beings and, and social beings have a need of, of physical contact. So we, 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 we do need social circles. And to some extent, of course, this is uh, the power of, uh, of cities. So, so cities are quintessential hubs of infrastructure. And because of uh, that, you know, this is a place where um, very uh, specialized economic activities can emerge and where people meet and in meeting ideas uh, emerge uh, and, and are exchanged. So that is the power of cities. But at the same time, um, uh, um, you know, once a lot of the interaction, not everything can be replaced, of course, but a lot of it can be as effective, you know, through online means. And so it's, of course, I can't look into the future and none of us can, but um, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's an interesting scenario, yeah. And I would say that in the Netherlands, we have a very different urbanization pattern eh, from um, in, in comparison with other countries, whereas Argentina clearly has Buenos Aires as a very big metropolitan hub, and most countries have only one or a few metropolitan hubs. The Netherlands doesn't have such a pronounced urbanization pattern. You know, in our country, it's quite evenly spread. And historians say that it is because of the fact that we had this fine mesh network of waterways, you know, already many, many centuries ago. So that, um, uh, and they, that's what they say explains um, this very particular infrastructure situation explains why we had a different urbanization pattern. I think that and, is very really good. Know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and let's say what, what we see uh, is in, in most countries, we see this pattern of what we call associative growth, which is very typical uh, for complex adaptive systems. So you have this metropolis, which is very well connected, and because it's so very well connected, it, it attracts all new connections at the cost of other parts of the country. Um, and uh, that... Uh, model may not be tenable, you know, I think in a long term. So by proactively uh, developing infrastructure in other areas, you create growth opportunities, uh, which I think overall leads to a less vulnerable pattern. I think a that's more really robust pattern. Because in, in, in many cases, what, what you see now is that many people had have gotten accustomed to, to say now infrastructure is about efficiency. Uh, and, and maybe not, because we are in a leapfrogging moment and, and infrastructure is now a, a leave to change the reality. So maybe now you have the opportunity to rethink it. Uh, I, I'm not saying from the scratch, but to, to rethink the way, for example, Argentina works. And it may be the moment where if you do have the territory and the environment, and now you have the technology to, to connect the people, you can think again on, on repopulating this territory and uh, uh, reshaping the sizes of the cities, which is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it may now be possible because of the communication technologies, because of the changes in in. in in the behavior of the people now due to, due to the pandemic and, and, and also because of uh, the, the new values of living closer to nature and, and in a more yeah. sustainable fashion. So I know this may yeah. be too uh, far in the future ideas, but at the same time, you know, if you look at some of the things people are discussing and even investing in, like Tesla, for example, they are making an option by investing into that particular company. Uh, 
So let me, let me, I know we are reaching the, our, our time, but I'd like to ask you for a couple of more uh, big ideas, so to say. So one of them is, uh, is uh, if you can share with us uh, what uh, the International Symposium on Next Generation Infrastructures that you have created and you lead right now is about. Ah. I think um, let, let me first start with uh, some of the things you, you, you said. Right? When we think of, our, of infrastructure for the future, um, it's, it's, of course, it's not just about efficiency. And we may have been a little bit, uh, um, our, or our, I think the thoughts of many engineers have been shaped by this neoliberal concept of um, infrastructure is all about uh, efficiency and about markets. But I think that for the future, the first question should be, what is the society that, uh, that we want? What is, the, what is the society in which we want to live? What values should it adhere to? What values are important to us? What are the societal priorities? And, the, and then the question of what infrastructure is it that can make that society uh, possible, you know, which, which brings that society into being. That is the next question. It's not the first question. So I think that is um, a very, it's, it's a key point for me. And I would say that's also a key, it, um, a key concept that I would like to convey at, um, at the new International Symposium uh, for Next Generation Infrastructures. Um, perhaps I should already point uh, your attention to the fact that, well, I, of course, you know, we had, we, we, we have just decided because of the pandemic and because we do not yet believe that all the travel restrictions will be lifted in September, we have decided to um, postpone the physical event to next year, September. So it will be 7 to 9 September in 2022. And by that time, I hope that all the world is able to travel to Rotterdam. But in, um, on the way to uh, 2020, of online stepping stone events. And in September, we have invited uh, Saskia Sassen, she is uh, the author, she's of course a sociologist. And so you think, what does a sociologist have to say about infrastructure? But one of the concepts that she coined is the global city. And so in September, she will give a talk online on the future of the global city. And, uh, and the subtitle she promised us, and I can't explain it yet, is about the digital transformation of the urban night. So, Please be invited. Feel welcome on the 16th of September, an online event. Well, we so, will use our, our network at the institution to, to spread the world. Yeah, I will, of course, convey the invitation and, and I hope to see uh, many participants from Argentina. So that, uh, that is, um, uh, it's one of the things that we, uh, we do. And of course, we will um, reflect on the... Um, on, on the very interesting technological developments, but also on the institutional implications of those developments when it comes to smart grids and to smart services and to new markets uh, evolving in, uh, in the world of infrastructure. And we will uh, pay specific attention to the modeling and simulation and visualization of interdependencies between the different infrastructures. So I do hope that we, uh, uh, thus um, convince uh, a lot of uh, policymakers to to um, rethink their their policies and to um, rethink consistency between the different infrastructure policy domains. So, Margot, we are reaching our time. I'd like to uh, uh, again thank you for for this uh, um, really great exchange of ideas and and, and the way you. Uh, so openly have shared with us so many concepts and, and, and insights. And let me ask you one more question, maybe the last one from my side, which is, um, you know, the, the, the Dutch, the Netherlands um, is, is a very interesting country. And in many ways, um, I think it has a lot to, to tell about how, how the new paradigms are, 
are going to be in a way because it's a country with a lot of um, uh, thought and, and a lot of um, um, a, a long tradition, I have to say, of uh, making decisions um, uh, uh, about how to improve the quality of living given the conditions that country faces. Uh, and a very unique culture. So what I'm asking you, and maybe if you can share with us, is uh, if you have to say what may be one, two, or three examples or um, uh, lessons learned from the Dutch experience in order to think about the future of infrastructures elsewhere, um, what, what would you say? I mean, wh what is the Dutch, um, uh, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, what is the Dutch uh, message to, to other countries um, uh, for, the, for the challenges and also for the opportunities ahead? Uh, maybe three points. I would say um, building with nature is one of the new concepts that is really important for us. We are a very small country, very densely populated. Um, and so we have very little nature, but nature is a great help in keeping our country healthy and protected. Um, I would say uh, this aligns very well with another co with the concept of multifunctionality. So given the fact that space, physical space is so scarce in the Netherlands, we uh, are more and more uh, explicitly designing for multifunctional use of space. And infrastructure, of course, is an important part uh, here of because it is very uh, it's, it's space intensive, you could uh, you could say. And uh, just because of this, of principles like building with nature and about and multifunctionality in the development of new infrastructure, um, the cross sector collaboration between infrastructure providers is, um, is something that is really gaining traction in the Netherlands. And they have become aware that whatever they want to do with, uh, every, every, let's say every infrastructure provider knows that if I want to change anything of my, in my own infrastructure, I will run into at least three or four other infrastructure systems. So it's better to um, rethink our plans for the future, our investment plans together and plan together for the future. So this is happening more and more and it's producing really interesting results with more, creating more value for society and reducing costs. Margot, thank you so much. And let me finish uh, our conversation by, by saying uh, once again, that uh, it is a real honor for the Argentinian Engineering Center and myself as its president to be naming you an honorary fellow of our institution. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not only uh, hopeful, but also I, I am sure that uh, we will have in you um, a, a, a very valuable and unique uh, member uh, of our community uh, in, in many ideas and, and potential projects in the future. So thank you very much, a real honor for us, and we are in contact. The honor is mine, and thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. Have a good day. The same. Okay. Uh...